Have your Bibles now. Turn with me, please, to the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. And we're going to uh, continue where we left off night before last. And it's a real blessing to get back into this particular area tonight. And I pray that you'll let God speak to your heart and show you what I'm saying. Now, I'm going to give you the whole message in one statement are in a thought that I think is the most profound I've ever read outside of the Bible. And that is simply this. If you want to be successful in this life, find out what God is doing in relationship to you and join it. Now, I've never read or heard of a statement more profound than that. If you want to be successful in your life right now, find out what God is doing in relationship to you and join him. Now, that's what I'm going to preach on tonight. Now, that's the principle. And I'll spend the next few minutes doing nothing but developing that principle. Now, one of the things that I will answer is, where does faith come from? Or how do you get faith? And this is the big question. Now, I have made the statements. I don't make them anymore. And I'm making this for your benefit. This is what I'm going to say now is for your benefit. That if I just knew God's will about a given situation, I could believe it. If I just knew the will of God about something, I could believe God. But I, I don't make that statement anymore because, uh, folks, it's a little more difficult to believe God than you think. Now, it shouldn't be, but it is. In fact, the most difficult thing I know to do is to believe God. And then I ask myself the question sometimes, how stupid can I be when all I've got to do is put my confidence, my faith, my confidence in Jesus, the person of Jesus? And how in the world can I be so foolish not to trust him? But it's still the hardest thing in this world I know to do is trust Jesus. Of course, you may be a little different, but uh, I sort of doubt it. And uh, so tonight you pray that the Lord will open each of our eyes, each of us, open us up and let us see spiritually what we're saying. And I pray that tonight he'll do this for you. The second verse of the 11th chapter, and uh, you listen to this, these words, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Now, that little verse is one of the most baffling verses in the whole Bible. For a long time in my own personal life, I thought that the Lord was saying in that little verse, for by it, and of course the it is obvious, it's talking about faith, the elders obtained a good report, and I thought that this verse was saying, by faith the elders lived a life that's mentioned, you know, these great saints of God. It's mentioned here in this chapter and others. They lived by faith, and because they did live by faith, they were able to do great things for God, and God gave them an A or a B or a C, you know, a good report. <laughs> and this is the way that most people believe that verse uh, is speaking. One day I was reading a book by A.J. Gordon, and I ran across uh, his thoughts concerning this verse, and all at once I realized that there was something more in this verse than uh, what the King James revealed, and if even if you have an Amplified New Testament, you get home tonight, you read it out of the Amplified, you'll see that there's something more 
in this verse, in the original, than right here. And of course, when you see it in the whole context, it's something else, and this is what I want you to see tonight. Now let me give you a human illustration that will make sense to you humanly, and that is this about where faith comes from. If you walked into this building tonight and you looked over this uh, auditorium and you could see that all of these pews were rotten, all of them now but one, and you remember that I'm speaking this message in the context of a message night before last, and, and you folks that weren't here, I'm sorry, but I can't go back and pick you up. Uh, so... That's just something I can't do. I wish I could. We don't have time. But if you walked in this service and you could see all these pews were rotten but one, and realizing now that faith is acting, remember the pew? And you, you literally, which pew would you sit on? Which pew would you place your body in? Which pew would you go and use? And let that pew do for you what it's designed to do. Would you use one of the rotten pews or would you use the pew that's not rotten? Now you come in, you look over the pews, all of them are rotten but one. Which one would you take? You say, well, preacher, I'm not stupid. I'd take the one that I could see would hold me up. Well, obviously, in a human sense, then, your faith to deposit your body at that pew came from seeing. Right? Now, Paul says we do not walk by sight, but we walk by faith. But he didn't say that faith didn't see. Now, faith is never a leap into the dark. It's always a leap into the light. Jesus didn't say, I'll push you. He says, follow me. And he is the light of the world. Amen. Now, I didn't say in the light of understanding, but I'll tell you, because understanding is of the sense world, but in the light of truth. Now, this little verse here really brings us into some beautiful things, and I want us to just pray earnestly that God will open our hearts and let us see. You see, the, one of the greatest things that happens to a person when they get saved, born again, is they take on a capacity to know God. That's the greatest thing that happens to you. Not that you're going to heaven. Most people think, boy, the greatest things happen. But praise God, I'm going to heaven. No, folks, the greatest thing that happens to you when you get saved is you take on a dimension to live in two worlds at one time. You see, there is a spirit world and there's a physical world. And when you get born of the spirit, you get born you again and you take on a capacity to live and commune and fellowship in a spirit world as well as a physical world. And that's the greatest thing in this world can happen. And I'll tell you, you take on a capacity to know God and that capacity can't be beat. And you say, well, I don't know what you're talking about. You ever get born of the Spirit of God, you'll know what I'm talking about, and I don't try to explain it. I'm just to proclaim it. Jesus had a man by the name of Nicodemus to visit him, and he simply said, Nicodemus, there, uh, you must be born again. Nicodemus said, I don't understand it. Jesus didn't try to help him to understand. He just proclaimed. He said, there's two worlds, physical and spiritual. He said, you've been born into the physical, you must be born again to get in the spiritual. Told him, said, if you're going to get born again, you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And my friends, uh, of course, we could get in that and take us a long time to get out. But the thing that happens to a person when they get saved is, folks, they take on a capacity to know God. And that's why I say that about 85% of your church members have never been saved. Because when God moves and God talks and God reveals... They sit there and look out the window. They don't even know what you're talking about. And by the way, some of the folk I've heard one or two comments that I just don't understand what that preacher is preaching. Have you ever read Job 28, 28? 
I'll tell you what, you may have read it, but I'll tell you what, you ought to go back and look at it again. Real outstanding lady, had about five degrees, heard me preach one night on the crucified life in Memphis, Tennessee, and she went home. So she had a little more discreetness about her and so on and so forth than most people. They didn't go around and talk. She didn't go around and talk about her con- her misunderstanding. She went to the Lord. And she said, now, Lord, I just don't understand what that preacher said. And uh, so when she said, Lord, I don't understand what that preacher said, and she had a Thompson Chain Reference Bible, so she looked on the word understanding and started running the references, and the first one was Job 28, 28. And if I remember correctly, it says to depart from evil is understanding. You know what it says? She said, thank you, Lord. She said, the reason I didn't understand that preacher is I'm full of the devil. She got down, got right with the Lord, and God gave her a revival, and she was one of the greatest instruments in that meeting for souls that week. Now, my friends, if you do not have understanding about what I'm talking about, it's obvious that you have never been born of the Spirit of God, or Satan has you bound up as a child of God, and you're not liberated. Yes, sir. Because I'm not, I don't preach to get you to understand. I preach that the Holy Ghost may show you what I'm saying. I'm not one of these preachers that are interested in being so simple that a child can understand what I say. I think that's stupid. I'm not more interested in being any more simple than God was. Boy, these fellows said, man, I want to make it so plain and simple. Now, I'm, not, I'm interested in making it plain, but not simple. So the Holy Spirit has to show you what I'm talking about tonight. And uh, I'm trying to get you with me because I want to take you somewhere. And you say, where? Out of this world. Paul said, I look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Well, that's a beautiful verse, isn't it? 2 Corinthians 4:18. He said, I look, we look not at the things which are seen, but we are looking, and this is my paraphrase, at the things which are not seen. You see, when a person gets saved by the grace of God, they're made alive to God, and they can literally, they know the voice of God. They can see God. They can hear God. And it's not with these naked eyes, and it's not with these naked ears, and it's not, my dear friends, Uh, with their emotions, that they feel God. But some way, somehow, God has the capacity, when a person is born again, to speak to that person, and they know it's God. And people say, Brother Manley, how do you know you know it's God? Well, friend, as long as there's any doubt, there's either one or two things wrong. Either you have never been born of the Spirit and do not have the capacity to know God, or, my friend... Listen, God hasn't spoken. Because when God speaks to one of his children, they know it. They know it. They really know it. And how God speaks. Now what I want to do is just simply take you out into the spiritual world for just a moment and show you that what I'm saying is not so ridiculous because Paul says we look not at the things which are seen. But we look at the things which are not seen. And this is important because we're living in a physical sense world, as I mentioned this morning. And if we say we're living in a spiritual world, too, and we're going to have to realize that that the real truth is the spiritual things that God says in his word. And here's the spiritual world, and here's the physical world, the sense world, and here in between is the Word of God, and here's the Holy Spirit that makes the Word of God real and personal to you, as if God was speaking it audibly, visibly, right before your eyes. And this is important. And a child of God has the capacity to see some things. Job said in Job 42, 5, in the original, there was a time when I heard you with the hearing of my ears, but he said, now, since I've gone through all I've gone through, he said, I see you with my spiritual eyes. Oh, um, I believe it's John, now, wasn't it? I don't know how the island of Patmos was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I believe he got such a glimpse of things that was going to happen that theologians haven't figured out yet what all he saw. 
But he did see something, didn't he? Amen. I don't think he saw that with those natural eyes. You see, I don't believe your natural man can stand the glory of God. The Bible proves that it could not stand the glory of God. How could your natural ears hear the voice of God? I put very little confidence in these folk who feel things and see things and hear things with a natural man. Why should God stoop to become so human, my dear friends, when he's God? And yet I know he can go on and reach out into the human area and do these things, but God can speak to the spirit of man. He is spirit. He is truth. And you go on. And there's another incident in the Bible I'd like to call you to your attention about an old prophet and a young prophet in the Old Testament. And the young prophet walked out of the out one morning and saw the area covered with a mighty host that had come to take them captive. And he came up frightened back into the place where the old prophet was and the prophet old prophet said Lord in essence open his eyes let the scales fell, fall from his eyes and the scales fell from his eyes and he looked out there with spiritual eyes and what did he see he saw the mighty host of Israel and man they were encamped about on the clouds the hills and everywhere else and he got so excited about it praise God man he got really excited he saw that which was not seen I'm sure John saw that which was not seen I'm sure that Paul, on the day the Damascus road, he saw him who was not seen. He heard him who was not heard. That other bunch didn't know what was going on, did they? Just Paul. Now, folks, you said, preacher, I don't understand. Well, you get saved or get right. You'll get with it after a while, one of the two. Now, you say, what are you talking about? Well, I'm just being a matter of fact about it. Folks, there's not only, not only does a child of God have the capacity to hear and see God. Like, for instance, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You've read scriptures over a thousand times, and then one day in a state of dilemma, a state of desperation, my friends, you read the word of God, and all at once you could see it. All at once it spoke to you. All at once, that verse became real to you. Has that ever happened to you? All of you've read a verse for thousands of times, and all at once, one day, that same verse of Scripture became alive to you, and God spoke to you. Not audibly, but you could see it. It became alive. It became life to you. And boy, it just thrilled your heart, changed your life. Now, this is what I'm talking about. You see some things that are not seen. You hear some things that are not heard. There are some things to be seen that are not seen. The Bible says this in Matthew 16, uh, 19. I'll just share uh, one portion of Scripture with you. We take you through many, but this is real good. In uh, Romans 16, 19, Jesus said to uh, Peter, he said... Uh, and the rest of them there with him on the 19th verse, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now watch it. Now the King James says, Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever thou shalt loose in earth shall be loosed in heaven. That's what the King James says. But folk, I'll tell you what, I'm not belittling the King James, but I want you to know one thing. That's a long ways from being correct. Now, I didn't say, now, the, the Greek interlinear New Testament, in the same verse, says this, and I want to read it, and this is as near, as far as I'm concerned, as you can get to it. I will give thee the keys of the kingdom of the heavens, and whatever thou bindest on the earth, now watch this, shall be having been bound in the heavens. Now remember, King James says, Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. But this says, and your Amplified says it, and a number of other translations, says this, Whatever thou bindest on the earth down here, down here, shall be having been 
bound in the heavens. Do you remember what I said when I started out? If you want to be successful, find out what God's doing, join him. You see that principle? It's there. Now watch it. I'm taking a little more time tonight, hoping, praying, and uh, that uh, you'll get some understanding. Now whatsoever thou shalt loose on the earth shall be having been loosed in the heavens. Now, what's he saying? Let me give you another illustration to tie this in. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is being done where? Oh, there's something up there being done. You say, what is it, preacher? The will of God concerning you. Amen. There it is, folks. The will of God in heaven for you in earth. And Jesus says, pray that the will of the Father that's done in heaven may be done in earth. Now, you couldn't want more than that, could you? I don't think you could. And that's exactly what he's saying in Matthew 16, beginning in the 19th verse. Whatsoever you lose or bind in earth... First, make sure that it's being bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose in earth, make sure that it's loose in heaven. Now, I know we come up here with our two big plans and get on our knees and beg God to bless us. But if they didn't originate in heaven, folks, you can beg God all you want to and you still haven't got a thing. Jesus is really saying, he said, I'm giving you the key. And the key is, you find out what is the will of God going on in heaven. And if you look out here and you see something going rampant and it's all loose and it's contrary to the will of God, a God's revealed will. He said that it's loose down here and it's contrary to God's will. God has it found in heaven. He said, I'll tell you what you do. You bind it in earth. And said, if you look out here and you see something all bound up, and heaven has set it free and loosed it, he said, then you loose it in earth as it's already loosed in heaven. In other words, you find out what God is doing and joining. Now, if he's really on your toes, like you ought to be, you'd already see the whole message. Amen. Where does faith come from? From seeing the will of God. You say, Brother Manley, that's hard. No, if you have no controversy between you and God tonight, the very desires of your heart should be the will of God. My friends, you never go out here and act in faith until you first know the mind of God. I mean, you find out what God says, and when He speaks, then you can act on it. And that doesn't mean that you run through the Bible and find some verse you can stand on. It means you run through the Bible and the Holy Ghost gives you some verse you can stand on. That the Holy Spirit gives you a verse that reveals the mind of God. A preacher came to a friend of mine one time and said, Pray for my family, they might get saved. He said, Do you have a verse from God? Well, my friends, there's hundreds of verses that uh, give you the mind of God concerning people getting saved. And this fellow said, Well, 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 I got a bunch of verses. He said, No, I won't do that. Has God spoken and given you a verse? He said, No. He said, well, when you get a verse from God, you come back and see me. So a few days later, the fellow came back and he said, I've got a verse. Completely out of context. He said, what's that? Not one hoof will be left. And God took that one phrase out of the Old Testament, spoke to his heart, showed him that not one of his children would be left in Egypt to die and go to hell, and every one of them was saved. He had no trouble with faith whatsoever when he got that word from God. Amen? <clears throat> Oh, well, what did he do? Well, that's very simply put right here in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. Very simply put. It's no 
beautiful, it's so fantastic, it's so obvious that uh, I don't see how we can miss it. And you say, Brother Man, it sounds easy. Well, it's not easy to see the truth. And you have to get in a certain condition of worship and repentance and so on before the truth opens up to you, but it's all right here. Uh, and I want to share it with you and show you what the, how these elders, these great men of God in the Old Testament, moved heaven into earth. And you say, well, Brother Manley, uh, they were great, great men. <laughs> I'll guarantee you there's some of you men in this building tonight that never committed some of the sins that Abraham committed. I'm not belittling Abraham. I'm just wanting to show you, my friends, that there were some men that's not even mentioned in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews that were more holy than Abraham and more holy than Moses. What about Enoch? Uh huh. What about a few? What about Elijah or Elisha? You never see them mixed up in sin like you see these other fellows, but they weren't even mentioned in this, right? Now, what I'm trying to say is not justify your sins, but I'm trying to show you, my friend, that, listen, if you're saved by the grace of God washed in the blood of the Lamb, you're qualified to trust God. You're qualified to trust God. In fact, you're obligated to. Now, watch this 13th verse. These all die, and back in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, these all die not having seen the promise, uh, not having received the promises, but now watch these words, because uh, words are very significant. Watch them now. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but, now watch it, now help me, having, what's that next word? I should have brought my glasses, I'm over 40. Oh, excuse me. But having seen them afar off, now watch what happened when they saw. They were persuaded of them. They embraced them, and what faith is acting, right? And the next thing they did, they confessed. Boy, there's your sequence of faith. You see, you're persuaded, you embrace, and you confess, and God performs. Right? That's it right there. That's the whole scope of the faith walk right there. Faith sees. Faith is persuaded. Faith embraces. That means acts. And then what you believe in your heart, you confess with your what? Mouth. Amen. That's it. And what you confess with your mouth, God performs. A bunch of them asked Jesus one time, said, Lord, said, now what about all this faith to just speak to a fig tree and it goes away? Jesus said, I tell you, said, you've got faith, said, you can say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and whatsoever thou sayest, and doubt not in thy heart, shall you shall have whatsoever you what? Say. Oh, that's beautiful. Now, listen. Let's just give you a couple of illustrations out of this chapter. I give you a bunch of them, but there's just a couple to do. In about the 17th verse, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, that he uh, that had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now watch this verse, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. Now, you, anybody wants to read that, that rest of that verse? Huh? Is there somebody, brother, you got it there? Yes. Yeah. Read it. It says, and figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Right. Revised. Right, that's revised standard. And in the King James it said he saw him, or he received him in a... Figure. Now, do you know the story? Boy, this is some story. Great goodness. Here is God saying to Abraham, after God gave him that son, after he believed God after doubting for 20 years, and God gave him this son, God said one day, now I want you to take him up and offer him on an altar. 
Now, some people have a little conflict with God, saying, how can God tell a man to stick a knife in his own son, let his blood drain out, and then burn him to ashes? Isn't that murder? Well, my friends, you're looking at it in the sense world, not from God's side. God knew what was going to happen from the beginning. God was only putting this man to a test. He knew what was going to happen. And God reserves the right to be God regardless of what you think. Amen. God knew that man wasn't going to have to kill that little boy. But my dear friend, he knew one thing. He was fixing to put his faith to a test and see what he would do it or not. And God knew the end from the beginning, so God wasn't worried about the fellow being guilty of murder. God was interested in a man being guilty of obedience to his word. And when God said to Abraham, Offer up your son, beloved, he was tried. And in this dilemma, he got so close to God, folk, that he looked into heaven. You say, preacher, how do you know? How do I know? Well, the Bible says so. He said that the Bible says so. Yes, in the eighth chapter of the book of John, Jesus was up preaching to a bunch of Jews one day, and they said, we are of our father Abraham. He said, yes. He said, I know if you'd be of your father Abraham, you'd be doing the works of Abraham. He said, I know you. He said, you're of the devil. He then, you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, your father Abraham, rejoice. Boy, listen to that next word. To see my day. And you know what the next one said? Next phrase? And it says, and he saw it and was glad. Thousands of years before Jesus Christ was ever incarnated, Abraham had a problem. And when he had a problem, he didn't go to one of these little counselors. All these preachers and their counseling today. Great, Scott, that's the reason why you don't have any deacons. They've got backbone like Saul's. You've got preachers who can tell them how to do it. And they'll get them through the storm, and then the next storm will put them under again. When 15, 16, 70 years ago, you didn't have a preacher come around about once a month and preach to them. And when a man or woman had a problem, they went off behind the bar and stayed out there until they met God. And when they met God, folks, they walked out of there with backbones like saw logs, revelation of heaven, and knew more about God. My dear friends, in, in 30 minutes, and most of us know the day in 30 years, because we got a library full of books that can give our heads full of understanding, but it takes a state of repentance and desperation before a holy God, before God can reveal anything to our hearts. I don't counsel with people. You say, why? Because when I leave, what I say will fade away. I tell them to get along and counsel with the one person who can handle it, and that's Jesus. And when I leave, he's still there. And boy, if they ever learn the way into his sanctuary and know how to fellowship with him, i got news for you. Bless God, it doesn't make any difference. Whatever happens to this preacher, they still know the way in. The greatest thing that ever happened to me, brother and sister, was the fact that I did not consult a bunch of theologians about what I needed. And somehow, some way, I missed that whole bit. I had to stay in the woods with Jesus till I, he talked to me. And I've been so grateful for that all of my life, you'll just never know. I've got a secret. Amen. And folk, that is, I know the way. And that's him, not man. I used to go with an old boy and I'd say, man, can't you help me? He said, if God can't do it, son, it'll never get done. I'd beg him, I'd plead with him, I'd get mad at him, I'd get upset, and I'd end up in the woods. And boy, I'd stay there until I had a living, living experience of a living Christ. One second with him, brother, solved the whole problem. Yes, sir. Abraham didn't go to a counselor, he went to God. And when he was out there, folks, God pulled back the curtain and he saw Jesus Christ incarnated. And when he saw Jesus Christ, he, he saw my friends. Not only Jesus Christ incarnated, he realized he had just had plainly had sense enough to know that his son had to live. He had to. And you talking about faith, brother. Boy, when he saw Jesus. His faith became so real 
and dynamic that he literally believed that God would bring that boy from action. You're talking about a resurrection. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Abraham believed that God would bring that boy from action. Because for him to have sacrificed that boy meant a knife in his body, drain all the blood from his body, burn his body to ashes. And yet he counted him as resurrected. Boy, isn't that something? Now, what is truth? What God says or what we think or feel, smell, taste, or hear? What is truth? And he acted on that truth. You know what he did? He said to his... He went and got his servants and said, Get fire, wood, knife. What about sacrifice? He said, God handle that part. Amen. That's what he did. And when he got to the foot of the mountain where he was to go up and offer up that sign, you know what he said to those men that's standing at the bottom? He said, you stay here, the servant, with the animals, and I like this. And he said, we will be back. Yes, he said, we will be back. He saw... He was persuaded, he embraced, he confessed. Say, folks, that's in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. Where did his faith come from? Huh? From hearing the voice of God, seeing the will of God, knowing the mind of God. Very simple, isn't it? It's all right there. Look, look, if you don't think it's there, just, let's just look at this one. This one fascinates me. And the 11th chapter was back there again. Oh, man, there's so much of this book fascinates me. I guess you get tired of hearing me say that. But look at this. It's all right here. Uh, 23rd verse. Read it with me. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they... Excuse me, I still need my glasses. What's that next word? Oh, they saw something. He was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Now, what's the opposite of fear? Faith. What's the opposite of faith? Fear. And say, folks, they lost their fear. You know why, preacher? They saw something. What did they see? That this boy was a proper child. You know the dilemma this mother and dad was in. Pharaoh had sent out a decree to all the midwives that when a little male baby was born, kill him. Moses was born. If it had been your little boy, what, what kind of predicament would you have been in? And I'm sure, folks, they sought God. And in that experience of seeking God, they saw he was a proper child. What does that mean? They saw who he was. And when they saw who that little old fellow was, they didn't have any fear. Boy, that mom and daddy locked their hearts in with God. Amen. Whew. Said, Lord, we see your glory. We see your will. We know what's going on. So we're doing it. And they join God by faith. And you're talking about God, folks. Man, someone said God and one man believing God is a majority. God and man together is a majority. And that's right. Because they, I mean, God even made the devil his slave in this instance. Here they put that baby out there in an old crocodile snake infested river in a little old basket. And here the Egyptian uh, queen, uh, king's uh, daughter came down by the riverside. And folks, she loved that Jew and that was a miracle. Amen. And then God turned around and made that Egyptian woman, my friends, hire that baby's own mama to be the babysitter. You couldn't beat that. You don't get paid like that. <laughs> and then God made the devil pay the diaper bill. 
The milk bill. Don't lie about it. Bless God, it's true. And reared him up and sent him to the university of hell and he still came out glorifying God. Now, isn't that right there in that verse, in that, that portion of Scripture? Amen? How did that happen, folks? Because there was a mother and dad who saw something. Now, if you don't think it's all the way through there, it's all the way through there. I'll just read the other one to you and I won't see it. I'll give it to you. 20 first, 27 first says, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured as, uh, there's that word again, as seeing him <laughs> who was invisible. Where did Moses get such faith? He looked in. Amen? Now where does faith come from? Knowing the mind of God. Doesn't have anything to do with feeling. And folks, before you can believe God for something, you have got to know. And when you know, you know, you know. There's no doubt about it. That God has spoken. Now don't start looking for him in the whirlwind. And the thunder and the lightning and the storm. Because he may be in the still small voice. But folk, when he speaks, you'll know. He said, you hadn't told me a thing, yes? I've told you enough that the thing is, uh, that's necessary for you to get desperate enough that God will have to speak. Have you ever studied the life of Elijah when he prayed? You know, we say, Lord, boy, if he went out and saw Israel all in sin, and he got down, he'd have been a Baptist. Now, this is what he'd have done. He'd said, now, dear God, I'll tell you this bunch needs revival, and I've got a program. And said, I'll tell you, my program is that if you'll just stop heaven up for three years and six months, he said, uh, I believe he'd shake the devil out of this bus, we'd have a God. <laughs> Folks, is that really what happened? Have you ever checked it out? <laughs> Elijah looked at Israel, and she was in sin, and he was desperate. And he loved God, and he was God's man. And no doubt, if you check his life out, he was walking with God. And I'll put it in a way that I pray that you can't misunderstand it. One day, God said, Elijah, I got some plans. I want to take you up and let you see the water part in heaven. He pulled back the curtain and showed Elijah that it was his plan for it not to rain for three years and six months. Elijah said, I see it. I'm persuaded of it. I'll act on it and I'll go out and confess it. It's not going to rain for three years and six months. And he said, if you do, I'll do it. And brother, that man confessed that it wouldn't rain for three years and six months and God zipped up heaven. He moved heaven into earth. James Stewart's mother James A. Stewart from Scotland <clears throat> walked in one day and said, James, said, uh, here's your new Bible. And said, you won't be needing these football charts anymore. And James said, uh, what are you talking about? She said, well, James, you're saved. He said, saved? He said, Mother, I'm not saved. You know how some folk talk backwards. He said, I'm going to go to hell and play football. And uh, he loved soccer football. And he was quite outstanding when just 14 years old. And he said, uh, I'm not saved. She said, oh, yes, James. He said, here's your Bible. And I'll take these charts down. You're saved. He said, oh, no, I'm, I'm going to go to hell and play football. She went down to the church. She said, you can quit praying for James and just start praising God. That's another type of prayer. Said, he's saved. She went to the youth director and said, sir, 
in two weeks on a certain night, I want you to remember to have James placed to testify of his salvation. Dr. Stewart tells the story. I've had him to tell it to me personally as we've been going down the road in the car because I want to make sure I had it right. I need thrilled. He said that he walked around on the streets of Glasgow, Scotland for two weeks. And he said folk would walk up to him and say, Praise God, James. We've heard, man, you've been saved. He said, that's my fanatical mother. He said, I'm going to go to hell and play football. He said, I'm not saved. And he said, every day somebody would come up and say, Praise God, James. We heard you've been saved. And one day, while playing soccer football, he said, the Spirit of God just literally slayed him. And he said, he fell down in the middle of that field. He said, Lord, save me. And said, right there, he put his trust in Jesus. And he said, the Lord saved him. And said, man, he got out of that place as fast as he could get out of there. And went home, you know, just excited as a 14-year-old boy, just to jump and jump and just, just really excited. And said, he ran in the house just screaming out, Mama, 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 I've been saved, I've been saved, I've been saved. And she said, shh, James. She said, son, I've been telling you for two weeks. <laughs> By it, the elders obtained a good report. You know what they're really saying? They're really saying, folk, that when they had troubles, they looked into heaven and got the report. And when they got it, they were persuaded of it, they embraced it, they confessed it, and God performed it. I don't know, folk, how in the world we can expect God to ever send us revival going off in these prayer meetings begging God to do so. When we ought to be praying God, do something here. Get me in such a shape that I can find out what you want to do and join you. It take all the confusion out of your life. Dilemma, everything else. Find out what God's doing and join. You said, preacher, that's not in the Bible. A little old preacher stepped out on the deck of a ship one night when all hope was gone. Well, one morning. And the Bible says all hope was gone. And this little old fellow stood up when all hope was gone and said, Be of good cheer. <laughs> Boy, what a, what a discord that must have been. Amen? Amen? Well, they were ready to die. They'd given up hope. And this little old fellow stepped out and said, Be of good cheer. That stupid idiot said, Be of good cheer. He said, Everything's going to be lost but your lives. So not one of you going to die. Say, Paul, where did you get such a message? Say, Paul, where did you get such stuff as that? He said, somebody came by last night and gave me a report. And all I'm doing is confessing to you what report I got. If you don't believe that's the Bible, check it out. Last couple of chapters, book of Acts, you'll find it. Amen? No wonder he had faith when that snake bit him. Because that same angel that talked to him about no one's going to die told him, said, you're going to Rome, son. <laughs> Amen. Why should he be worried about a little old snake? Did he? When God said your destination is Rome, God said that you better believe. If you get upset not at a snake bite, just to the look at the devil. You get upset. He bit Paul and he didn't get upset. Amen. You know why, folks? He got to report that he was headed to Rome. <laughs> Amen. When I was two and a half years old, I was dying with a problem. My mother tells me. She never told me until years and years after I started preaching him. She said uh, she called the doctors out, and it was 18 miles in the country. And uh, 
they checked me over and said, well, Mrs. Beasley said he'll die. In two and a half hours, he'll die. They said this fever is going around his head and said he'll die and said that it'll be over forever. And they told her the truth as far as they were concerned. And my mother slipped out the back door, went out underneath an old tree and got on her face. She knew nothing about it this message she didn't know anything about it theologically but she went out there and had a little talk with Jesus and the Lord she said showed her out there that night that I was just simply born to preach and that's all she said didn't even say anything about it you living said that you were born to preach and she said that's all I need because I knew you couldn't preach dead <laughs> and my mother's quite unemotional almost angelic but not uh, not emotional folk very quiet never reared in anything but just the quietest calmest deadest atmosphere of a Methodist and Baptist church so folks, she got a little report out there that night. She came back in, and she said, Doctors, she said, you can go home. They said, well, Ms. Beasley, don't you want us to stay? It won't be long now. She said, oh, no. She said, you don't need to stay. She said, well, it be, might be good if we were here when he passed away. She said, oh, no. She said, he's not going to die. She said, God said he was born to preach, and he won't preach dead. And, folk, I think the obvious is obvious. I'm not dead. But this is what I've been saying to you. Where'd she get her faith from? She looked in. She heard God. She saw God. God spoke to her heart. Simply gave her a witness in her spirit that he was born to preach. She didn't even have a promise from the Word. But somehow God spoke to her heart. She knew it was God. And yet many times, like myself, when I was dying a couple of years back, a year and a half ago, and I knew I was going to die, I said, Lord, do you have anything to say to me? And I said it last night, but I'll repeat it just to solidify the whole message. And I slipped out of bed, and my friend God said, Thou shalt see thy children's children. And see, I got the report. And after that, for six solid months, I went down, 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 down. Nearer, nearer, nearer death. But I had to report that it was all all right. And what I'm saying to you tonight, this message is the key to faith. It's the key to success. It's the key to walking with God. Find out what God's doing and join Him. And folk, if you have any kind of problem tonight, you are not taking advantage of your birthrights till you know what's going on. Because God wants to show you. He said in Isaiah, Command ye me of things to come. He said, command it. Amen? And if you think this is a foolish message, beloved, poor old brother Noah, when he looked in, he got so much, he even got the dimensions of the ark. God gave him the blueprint. He knew what he was going to be of before he built what he built. Amen? And Moa, Abraham, it said he went out not knowing whether, but folk, I've got news for you. He sure knew where he was going. You said he did? <laughs> yeah. He saw a city. Amen. And he said he saw the streets, the light. He had the whole thing. He knew where he was going. He just didn't know the path on the way. <clears throat> Right. But folk, he knew where he was going. He, he saw it all. Well, you see, 
your little desires and wishes and wants. You just can't act in faith because of something you might like, or something you'd like to see God do. You first find out what God's will is and then act. It's not a leap into the dark. It's a leap into the light. Amen. May the Lord bless you. You're dismissed.